Okay. Well, we look forward to working with you guys tonight and getting your questions answered and giving you a bunch of information to help you do this FACR process uh, well. And we're going to call this the Pathway to ACR Fellowship. I serve on the Board of Chancellors, chairing the General Small Emergency and Rural Practice uh, Commission. Next slide, please. Our committee is comprised of a diverse set of uh, members of the college. We have Mark Adams and uh, Catherine Everett, who are diagnostic radiologists, along with Kathleen Ward. We also have interventional radiology represented with Zeke Silva. We have radiation oncology represented with Bill Small from Chicago area. And we have physics represented by Tony Seibert from the West Coast. Next slide. Yes, thank you. So the fellow of the American College of Radiology is one of the highest honors a member can obtain, a member in good standing. ACR fellows demonstrate a history of service to the college and organized medicine, teaching and or research. Over the years, about 10% of college members have been uh, awarded this honor. Now, who is eligible to apply for FACR? So fellow applicants must be a member in good standing with at least 10 years of consecutive ACR membership, consecutive ACR membership. The 10 years of membership may occur before a gap in active paid membership if the member temporarily lapses in dues. Additional years of membership before or after a lapse in membership will be added to the total years of membership. I'll give you an example of this in a second. The ACR recognizes that lapses may occur and they do offer a one-time opportunity to buy back one year of lapsed membership. So for example, say you need 10 years of consecutive membership. Perhaps you've been a member for five years and had a gap of one year. Maybe uh, you were moving in, in a new location and forgot to renew your membership for that year and then you became a member again for five more years, four or five more years. You can buy back that one year gap in between so that you will achieve the minimum 10 years of consecutive ACR membership. We allow that for just a, a one year of lapsed membership. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Pyatt. Now, take this opportunity to remind our attendees that there is an opportunity to post questions. If you would like to post them there, we can take them up at the end of our webinar. Thank you. Okay, now the application has a number of categories. We have basic applicant information, membership information, certifications like CAQs and boards and things like that, activities, academic appointments and honors, <clears throat> presentations, uh, organized medicine in the medical community, publications, research, areas that you may have received recognition, and then we have your CV, and then also the code of ethics, the endorsement letters, and, and the submitting to chapter. We'll be covering some more of these in detail along the way here. Next slide, please. So the Committee for Fellowship Credentials and the chapters work together in this process. So the ACR will forward all complete FACR applications to the chapters before their spring deadlines. This is uh, what Julie will be doing. Chapters review the applications and forward their recommended nominations to the Committee on Fellowship Credentials by June 30th. So our committee receives these by June 30th. After that, then we start acting on them. The CFC reviews the nominations and we select the candidates. Uh, during the course of the summer in July and August, we have a number of meetings. Each candidate is discussed in great detail. I mean, tremendous detail and unanimous vote is obtained on each candidate's application. And a lot of times that takes a lot of discussion and uh, give and take and presentation of uh, important points to each candidate. But each candidate receives a really thorough review. And then the candidates, uh, we present our slate of, to the Board of Chancellors in the fall, in September or October, depending on when the meeting is. And then after that meeting, after the Board uh, makes their decisions, the candidates are notified. Next slide, please. So the chapter review leading up to the June 30th deadline is, is a really vital role in screening all of the potential FACR candidates. Each chapter will select their own submission deadline. They do vary among chapters. And the dates are posted on the ACR website. The, ideally, chapter leadership positions should be filled prior to receiving applications so that the applications can be 
uh, reviewed and signed off by the current the new leaders. The chapter is the most important assessor of the candidates because most of the candidates are known by the chapters and your familiarity with the chapter members provides great insight into their eligibility. We value greatly the input from each chapter. Utilizing the nomination criteria sheets also provides guidance in terms of keeping uh, everything uh, understood in terms of what the criteria are. We'll talk about that a little more. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so here's a question from Julie. Do you know your chapter's deadline for receiving FACR applications? If you can please choose one of the two and we'll get a poll of the audience here. Okay, so it's about 50-50. Okay, do you know how many total votes we had, Julie? We had 77% of our attendees responding. Okay. So I would say. All right. So this looks like an opportunity for improvement where if you don't know the date, you know, you need to check your chapter uh, uh, rules and regs guidelines to see what the deadlines are for your chapter. Okay. We'll return back to the to the PowerPoints. So the cri nomination criteria sheets are really helpful to you. By the way, on the right-hand side of your screen here, you can see some hot links, and we'll, Julie will be showing some of those along the way here. So the nomination criteria and domains. So there's three basic domains, service to the ACR and organized medicine, teaching, and research. And the activities are cross-referenced with years of membership. So uh, the, you have to have a minimum of 10 years consecutive membership to even apply. But for candidates that apply at the 10 to 11 year uh, uh, level, have to have extraordinary, extraordinary accomplishments. These are, I mean, really, really extraordinary accomplishments, either in teaching or research or in service to the ACR and organized medicine. So to, that's really a high bar, and I just wanted to sort of uh, have everyone understand that. We, we do find candidates who um, who just are not at that level, and we we can ap approve candidates within with a one, two, or three year delay. If so, if somebody might be applying at the 12 to 14 year outstanding level, but they don't quite meet the criteria, but they would at the 15 year level, and they have 14 years in, then we would approve them with a one year deferral, so they would they would uh, go to the to the convocation uh, the following year the 15 to 17 year group. I hope I explained that adequately. But anyhow, so that's those are the different uh, levels. Uh, 20 plus years uh, is the most common. That's where we see the most number of people getting fellowship. Okay, and did you want to show that again there, Julie? That, yeah, here we go. This is a nomination criteria. So you can see the 10 to 11 year column, prominent leadership roles in the ACR, such as serving on the Board of Chancellors, awards from international medical organizations. It's really, uh, Really, these are extremely accomplished uh, individuals. Uh, down as you go across, you can see um, different uh, degrees of accomplishments, like at the 15 to 17 year level, maybe serving as chair of an ACR committee, or be regionally recognized in teaching and awards for teaching, things like that. And then greater than 20 years, be either be on a local or state uh, chapter committee membership, Another, you can see all the things below that. So we really go by these criteria quite a bit, and uh, we encourage each applicant to uh, record as many of these uh, things that they may have accomplished in their career. Thanks for that. Uh, those sections there, Julie. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. So you'll get an email from the ACR to, to one of the officers if you're going to be an FACR judge, and you can see how this. <clears throat> email reads, new assignment to judge for fellow of the ACR. A member of your chapter has submitted an FACR application for review. Although this email was sent to all chapter officers, only two officers, preferably the secretary and fellowship chair, are required to consider and provide a decision. Please click here to assess the FACR application. So 
So this is the type of email that you'll receive. And then on the next slide, you'll see this when you log in, when you hit the link, you'll get my judging assignments and you'll be logged in. And then this is what it actually looks like. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the name, the person's name, their application number. And then you can see the box review application. And then over on the right side, refine your search, you can actually look at the scored ones or the unscored ones. You know, sometimes you can't get them all done at the same time. You might get one or two done and then come back. It does take a while to go through all of the material. There's quite a bit of information for each candidate. So that's how it looks. Okay, and then uh, the chapter then makes their decision. You have three options. You can either approve as a chapter nominee, you can concur with fellows, or you cannot approve. But this is uh, what one of the screens will look like here. You have to make your decision where you see the drop down there, approve as chapter nominee, or the drop down, the other two choices. We'll show you that. I think the next slide has a little more information. Yeah, here we go. So, Chapter sets your application submission deadline. Then there's three options for you. Approve as chapter nominee, which means the chapter is aware of the applicant's contributions and encourage the individual to apply. Or approve as concur with fellows. The chapter is not aware of the individual. They might not be very active in that state chapter, but they have done a number of things and uh, may be uh, feeling to apply. So you can uh, agree with the fellows that and still endorse the applicant, even though you're not, as a chapter, not strongly familiar with or aware of the individual. Or the third option, if you don't feel they meet the criteria, then you score them as not approved and you notify the applicant. Receive, we must receive all of these no later than June 30th, the chapter decisions. Now, this is a very important point here. The CFC gives more weight to chapter nominee decision than concur with fellows. So if your chapter approves as a chapter nominee, that carries more weight in the FACR decision than concur with fellows. Now concur with fellows does carry weight, but it's not as much weight as chapter nominee. Just wanted to be sure people understood that. There's been some confusion over the years with that. Okay. So here is, uh, Julie just called up this nice document here can see the nomination packet. These are the various pieces that go with that. By the way, we do have, uh, we have updated our nomination criteria, so it now includes military nomination criteria. So if you have active duty military members or former military who have a number of accomplishments when they're in the military, we now uh, have that spelled out by category, and you can consider that in your review of the candidates. Also, down below there, uh, where Julie's just highlighted, if a chapter officer provides an endorsement letter for the applicant, that officer is not eligible to vote for that nominee. Very important. That is, either the officer writes an endorsement letter or approves the applicant but cannot do both. Thank you, Julie, for showing that. Also, the next one, if the applicant is not approved, the chapter provides a detailed letter of explanation to the FACR administration and indicates whether the nominee is eligible to reapply at a later date. The chapter is expected to notify the applicant in such cases. These are some important understandings that may not be well known. By the way, all of this material is available on the ACR website, and this uh, recording here tonight will be uh, available on the ACR website and also on our YouTube ACR uh, section. So if a nominee transfers to another chapter between the time of nomination and the BOC action, the nomination must be referred to the new chapter for concurrence prior to a decision. That's an important point also. Doesn't happen very often, but it's important. Okay, now let's see. I'm having that bottom line. Is, there we go, thank you. All applications, including those not approved by the chapter, must be submitted to the ACR. So including those not approved by the chapters, just so we are aware of, of your decision. There is some information here about the endorsement letters, very helpful. Um, please follow these uh, guidelines, what the letter should say and what they should not say. Uh, it's really important to be specific in the letters. So you wanna highlight the specific achievements, be it in service, teaching, research, whatever. Really important to highlight those, as well as any other information you may have about the candidate that uh, may not be well known. 
highlighting portions of their CV sometimes is helpful. Okay, and I'm sure there'll be questions generated out there, so please, if you have questions, please let us know on your screen there. Okay, so, whoops. Okay, so FACR application. So this is on the website <clears throat> under the member resources tab. Encourage your chapter members to review the minimum requirements prior to applying. This is very important. You, you wanna make sure that they realize what category years of membership they wanna to apply to and whether they've met the, you know, the criteria examples that we give there. And you might be helpful to them in terms of if you think they're applying at, a, at the inappropriate year level, then you can help them uh, get into the right year level and maybe they, some of them may need to pause for a year or two until they are more likely to get to achieve the, the FACR. Sometimes we see them applying too early. With that, uh, the criteria are pretty demanding in their 10 to 11 year early years like that. If you have questions, you can be in touch with Julie at the uh, FACR administrative office at the college. And, and Bob, um, we can point out that yeah. this webinar has three handouts, and most of what we're referencing are attached in this webinar, so they can open those um, at their time during this webinar. Additionally, on the website that is listed here for ACR.org, the ACR Fellowship Guide and the nomination criteria, both reviewed by Dr. Pyatt, are available on our website, not only for chapters reference, but also all of those applicants. So you can refer your chapter members to ACR.org to the fellowship page to make sure they are reviewing all of the minimum requirements and also some guidance to help them with their application components. One of the things I wanted to mention was on the endorsement letters. So when one of your candidates begins the FACR application, that bottom right slide there, when they begin that process and go through that process, the electronically the college will notify whoever the candidate has listed for his, letter, his or her letters of uh, endorsement. So for example, um, you'll get, a, a, like I just recently got an email from somebody who's applying, notifying me that their application is uh, available and that I can do my letter of endorsement and upload it. It's very nice and easy. You just click on it, upload it, it has to be in a PDF format, and it goes being electronically right into their application and then it notifies them that that letter of endorsement has been received from from you and uh, it works nice very smoothly and let's see what there was yes right Julie was just highlighting there put that arrow back <laughs> Julie so are you in a business practice with that candidate see that section right there so yes I am in a business practice with the fellow candidate no I am not so this is part of the endorsement letter uh, information uh, that you'll need, and you can see up above um, qualifications. These are the kinds of things you want to keep in mind when you do your endorsement letter. Yep. Okay. Again, if you have questions, let us know. Raise your hand there. So, encourage your chapter members to volunteer for leadership positions. Help them serve on chapter committees if they have interest. If they have interest in the college, have them be in touch with the membership commission and uh, and you know get on that list of being interested volunteering for uh, committee work. Uh, also, other things that uh, help in uh, the FACR process are publishing and peer-reviewed journals. That's important. We discuss that. The committee discusses these things. Teach a course. That that definitely counts. Uh, the more you teach, the better. We have some candidates who, it's unbelievable how many courses they've taught, not just in the United States, but around the world. Incredible. There's a lot of really uh, hardworking radiologists, radiation oncologists, physicists, IR rads out there uh, doing good work. Presenting at regional conferences, that's another piece. Please be sure, encourage your members to keep their CVs current. Capture all of those things that they've done. Keep them current. Uh, also, the, our committee, the CFC, is looking to mentor early career radiology also. It's something we want to try and do more of, and I would encourage every chapter to try and mentor early career radiologists. Have them get involved in your chapter's work. Find ways to help them. Call the college if, if you don't have an answer and we can help. So we want to mentor early career radiologists as much as we can. See, Bob, I'm going to have us move back to the FACR review by chapter. We have a question that asks, 
What would you say that the FACR review and decision is a science or an art of assessment? Right. Maybe this is the question if it's more you know, subjective or objective given the rubric that we have for the nomination criteria. Right. So we have, there's so many elements to a candidate's application. When we went earlier in the program, we had a list of, oh my gosh, I can't remember how many it is. It's probably 10, 10 different uh, sections of, you know, their CV, their teaching, their research, their service. Um, there's many, many aspects of this that we consider uh, as well as the chapter, chapter scoring is nominee or concur with fellows. <clears throat> but there are many, many sections um, that are considered. So we don't have a specific point total in terms of if, you, if you're talking about being scientific, like, you know, there's so many points for this section and so many points for that section. But we do rely a great deal on the nomination criteria and what the chapters uh, say in terms of your review of the candidates. So I would say those are the most important things. We, we refer to the nomination criteria a lot. So the, there's many examples on that criteria. So it is very scientific in that sense. Yeah, Julie, if you can put up the nomination criteria, that would be, yeah. So this is really, really helpful. So if in order to get the FACR at the 10 to 11 year level, we really follow that, that vertical column there and those things. And if people don't achieve those things, then they just don't qualify at that level. Now they may qualify, you know, at a, at a different column, you know, and we could approve them at a two year or three year deferral and they would be approved and they would uh, receive the FACR. But um, we do follow these examples a lot. So I would, I would ask everyone to please be familiar with this and, and re refer your candidates to this, these nomination criteria. So there is a lot of uh, solid science, so to speak, basis on how we make our decision. Dr. Pyatt, there was some interest in reviewing the current application given that is um, has been new for last year and all the different components within it. So if we had um, just a few minutes, we can click each of these. This is a test applicant and we can have our chapter officers review the current sections of an application so they can see it from the perspective um, of the current application. So the items that were listed in your slide before, I believe there are 13 different components, begins with application information and gives you an idea of what is visible within each section. Yeah, this is good. So like under certifications, okay, so you can see ABR certification 2009, add another certification. So you might have CAQs or, or other certifications there activities, ACR or chapter activities, Virginia chapter of the ACR counselor. Whoops, just go back for a second there, Julie. So for example, this person was a counselor first term. You can see I have the start date. Counselors is uh, very valuable. Uh, also uh, officers in state societies like the Florida Radiological Society. Those things are all uh, important and they are up on the criteria. If you review the criteria, you'll see we have those types of things up there. Okay, academic appointment. So this is important, but not everybody has this. So if you do have academic appointments, we wanna know about that and the details of all that. Very helpful, it's one of the many things we consider. Presentations, so um, some people have a small number of presentations, some have none, some have many. Again, it, it, all of these things collectively give us the big picture about the candidate. But uh, if you have had presentations, please be sure to include those in your, in your CV during your career. Those are important to keep track of. Some of you may have had an RSNA presentation or something like that. Just, you know, capture those in your CV. Organized medicine in the medical community. This is another important area that we look at. Some uh, members are very active in their county medical society or in the AMA or in all other medical societies. Uh, there are so many. Uh, it's really important to capture all that. This again demonstrates your service to organized medicine and the medical community and that's valued. Publications. 
another important area that we look at. So please keep track of your publications, uh, peer-reviewed literature, of course, but there may be other publications, book chapters and other things that uh, may be important for you to uh, claim credit for and uh, include in your application. Research and recognition. Uh, likewise, we have some uh, people out there doing fabulous research and also getting recognized for wonderful work. We want to be sure to capture all of that in the review of the candidates. <clears throat> the CV is important. We often go back to the CV if there's questions about, you know, what did this person do, when was that, or whatever. The CV is helpful. It does fill in some of the holes and things that are not, uh, it gives us more information about the candidate, I guess you could say. Code of ethics. So this is an important section of the application. We want everyone to review this and uh, answer it appropriately. There is an ethical piece to the FACR. Endorsements. Okay, so um, these are, thank you, Julie. You are required to have at least two, but no more than four endorsement letters from current FACR ACR fellows before you submit for chapter approval. Only one letter may be provided from an individual with whom you practice or are employed by the same entity. A system-generated message will be sent to each endorser with instructions on how to submit the letter. <clears throat> and then submitting to the chapter. This is the last bullet point here. <clears throat> Uh, some of the uh, applicants are radiation oncologists, so they would submit to Keros and things like that. So not everybody is a state chapter. Dr. Pyatt, we have another question. How has the review process evolved over time? So I would say, and I've only been in this position for two years as chair. So, but in that period of time, we have looked a great deal at the nomination criteria, and we. Um, and we also have listened to other committees within the college, like the Military Radiology Com Subcommittee is a new committee, and uh, the military radiologists have unique issues being in the military and serving overseas and so forth. They have a lot of trouble connecting with chapters and getting recognition for uh, very big awards that they may receive from the military medical community. So we work with them, and the, our committee made uh, military <clears throat> nomination criteria, which are have been really well received and we have had some uh, people achieve the FACR um, this this past year so we're happy with that so we're always working on trying to make the nomination criteria uh, as good as they can be uh, and we'll be reviewing that in the next uh, in the next year looking at the criteria to see if there's any uh, tweaks needed and we're looking at other ways to um, improve the FACR process. So I would say uh, as a quality improvement guy, I'm always looking for ways to improve things and to help the members. Bob, uh, Dr. Pai, another additional question. What is the balance of FACRs that are academic versus community radiologists? Right. So that's a common question that we've had. And, uh, uh, and it, we've had a good discussion on the committee on this within the last couple of months. So there's some people feel that the FACR favors academic people. However, I can tell you from the community radiologists that serve in the FA on the CFC that are, they have pushed back in that and said, no, the you know community radiologists have so many opportunities of things they can do to serve either with their chapter or with their within their health system, within their radiology department, their medical staff. Because you know you get you also get recognition like if you're a medical staff president or you serve as on the board of, uh, board of directors for your hospital, or if you're a medical director for a department, there's many ways you can, as a non-academic radiologist, a private practice radiologist, achieve many ways to also be eligible for FACR. So uh, on, on the other hand, some people feel that academic radiologists have more opportunities. So in the most recent discussion on this in our committee, we we believe it's a, it's a draw, it's, it's, it's a tie. <laughs> so, whether you're private practice or whether you're an academic radiologist, there are many opportunities and ways for you to have uh, application, meet the application criteria and achieve FACR.
questions? Uh, we don't have any other questions at this time, Dr. Pyatt. I'll use this opportunity to make our chapter officers aware that their deadlines are posted on the ACR website. So before we conclude with our final slides, I'll give you the opportunity to review your individual deadline posted on the ACR website. This can be amended at any time. You can send an email if the functions within your committee will be revisiting applications later than you've originally posted. If you have a March deadline, for example, and you want to push it to April or May, just send an email to my attention and we can update that. And it's also helpful for your chapter members to have that information online as well. And that's why we share it with everyone on our website. That's very helpful showing that, Julie. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. OK. So takeaway points from the webinar. And again, uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. We, we have time. We can cover anything else you need here. So f first, identify your chapter's application deadline. That slide that you just saw from Julie there. Amend the date if needed and update FACR administration. That's a really important one. Number two, encourage your chapter members to apply. And also, we talked earlier about encouraging and mentoring early members of your chapter to get involved and try and assist them in getting involved, either in their state chapter or with the college. Uh, we, would, we would be very interested in helping you if, if uh, you need that help. Remind the applicants to adhere to the submission deadline. That's very important. We would hate to have somebody miss the deadline by a week. So be sure you get that date out there and get it well known. Nomination criteria, I can't emphasize enough how important these are in terms of guiding applicants to make sure they apply at the right year level and uh, are more likely to achieve the, the uh, approval if they apply at the right level, year level, and also if they have meet the various criteria examples that we give there. Lastly, decisions by the chapter. So. How the chapter decides will be very important to the discussions and decision by the CFC. So approve as a chapter nominee is the highest uh, value that you can give to a candidate. If you approve as concur with fellows, that's still valuable. It's not as strong as chapter nominee, or if you decide not approved. Those are your three options. <clears throat> are there any questions out there? Let's see, we do have a few. In the final decision of successful nominees, is there an absolute value to achieve, or are the nominee accomplishments compared to each other in the year award? Right. So each candidate, we're not, we don't compare candidate to candidate. It's not a competitive thing between candidates. We look at each candidate's material and all the information we have about them and match it up. We match it up to the nomination criteria. So under the area of service, we look to see what they've accomplished in that area. Under the area of teaching and under the areas of research, we look at the criteria and match each candidate to um, the criteria. And then uh, the members of the committee, we individually score these up. And then we get a profile on each candidate of our scores. So uh, it does vary. Not every candidate uh, is a slam dunk. Uh, many candidates we have a discussion on. And every candidate receives a full discussion every candidate, and we, we have as many as, uh, oh my, 110, 120, some years, even 130 candidates. So uh, we, every candidate gets a thorough discussion, and this involves many hours, many hours of review of each candidate's application. We all take down notes about the highlights of that candidate, and then when we have our conference calls, we discuss the uh, can, each candidate so and how they match up with the nomination criteria. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Do you have another one, Julie? Compared to surgery and cardiology, um, how would you compare that um, radiology is perhaps difficult to attain that fellow position? Right. So that's a good question, and that has come up on the Engage uh, Open Forum discussion. So there's been a great deal of discussion on this. It was uh, talked about quite a bit on the Open Forum, and uh, the, the impression that we, our CFC, had from that and other leadership is that there's still a great deal of um, 
feeling that the FACR is a very highly coveted uh, award uh, that is earned with a great deal of accomplishments, either in service, teaching, or research, or combinations of those three, <clears throat> as well as some time, uh, 10 consecutive year minimum time. So there's a there's not a lot of not a lot of strong interest in reducing the um, the amount of work involved to achieve it. But there is there is we are listening to the younger members and are trying to look at ways that we can, uh, in some ways, make FACR more uh, attainable, such as mentoring early career radiologists and trying to assist them with getting involved in state chapter uh, committees or ACR committees and finding other ways to increase the number of radiologists, radonks, IRs, and physicists who achieve FACR. We want to see more. I would love it if we could see 20% or 30% of members you know, achieve FACR. So we are looking at ways to do that, and you'll hear more discussions about that in, uh, in the next year or two. There are things being discussed. So, um, but I would encourage you to, uh, as you're involved and your members of your state chapters are involved, be sure to capture all those things in their CVs and in their history, the speeches that they give, honors that they receive, all the various things. Those are all important to claim when you fill out your application for the FACCR to consider. We have another question that seems uh, quite similar to your nomination criteria overview that you've given yet. Is there a threshold for the candidate scores or is it relative? Right. So there's no point score that we award for each thing. It's, it's more or less um, how many different, again, getting back to the nomination criteria, how many aspects of the criteria did they accomplish? So. Um, Julie, I don't know if we can go back to that, if you could put that slide up there for nomination criteria. So if a candidate with a column, so I want to look at something like the 20-year level and the 15-year level. Yeah, so again, this is such an important reference. So every candidate, is their application is, is taken to this list and we look at what they've achieved. So under the 18 to 19-year level, have they served as a member on an ACR committee? Have they had a leadership role in an ACR chapter, such as a CAC representative? Or have they served as program committee chair for this annual state meeting? Or have they had other uh, leadership roles regionally or locally, um, as well as uh, other medical organizations, like county medical society officer roles, or serving in uh, their state uh, AMA uh, chapter, things like that. So this is the these are the kind of things that we look to see are in the candidate's application. And of course, we get down through the other columns too, be it in teaching or in research. But you can see where that is. And then the military, we have their own uh, additional criteria. If you are a military, former military or current military person, you get um, recognized for that. So now there's no point score to each of these, but the more that you achieve the various examples in here, then the greater the likelihood is of, of uh, getting approved for FACR. And, and then the, the most common group that we have is the last column on the right, 20 or more years, where you um, have served. And many people who have been in practice for 20 or more years meet many of these criteria. You know, you've served as a, on a committee membership and you've served in hospital or county medical society or health system roles <clears throat> you may have received awards. You may have done some teaching for the x-ray tech school or, or ultrasound school or whatever. There's just so many ways in, a, in your career that you can earn many of these uh, examples for the nomination criteria, especially in on the higher year levels. So although we don't give any particular point score, it's more of an overall feeling about the candidate, you know, and have they achieved uh, enough of these um, criteria to receive the award. I guess that's how I would answer that. Thank you, Dr. Pyatt. There's an additional question. Is there anything ethical or behavior transgression that would, in spite of a very strong application, disqualify an FACR applicant? Right. So there is definitely an ethical piece to that, and that was one of the 
uh, points that uh, Julie had earlier. Yes. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Julie. So we have the variety of important questions here. You know, as you go down the left-hand side of that screen there, have you ever been convicted of a felony or misdemeanor? You know, or have you been denied clinical privileges? <clears throat> or have you had disciplinary action taken against your license? These are things that are important for, for, uh, for you to report and also for the committee uh, considers and, and reviews. So there's definitely part of this honor is an ethical piece and uh, we do uh, seriously look at all of these issues as well. And that was a good question. Thank you, whoever asked that. It doesn't happen too often, but every once in a while, we, we an issue comes up like this uh, where there's uh, ethical, ethical issues of significance. <clears throat> Any other questions? There are no additional questions at this time. Great, okay, so let's see. We got all our takeaway points, and I think we just have one more slide after that. And that's Julie on the right and me on the left, and we really appreciate your time this evening. Please remember that this uh, webinar has been recorded, so it'll be available to you, and also the uh, really important hot links that Julie has included with this, you'll see over there on the right side, those will be part of the recording. And we are here to help you at any time with questions, so please feel free to contact us. Thank you for listening tonight, and we hope you much success and many qualified candidates. Thank you.